So my name is Mike Bouchon. Is, that, is it as loud to you guys as it is to me? Yeah. Wow. Well, I'll just whisper for the rest of the thing. Okay, are we down a little bit? Down a little bit? Yeah, we're close. Okay, so my name is Mike Bouchon. Uh, I'm from Brocade. I'm vice president of product management for Data Center, uh, which covers off the routing and switching projects. Um, oh, there we go. Um, I'm going to spend just about 25 minutes today talking about how I see the rest of the, uh, everyone talks about software, everyone talks about the evolution of the data center. I think there's a lot of impressions that mobile, social, local, big data, all the kind of buzzwords, you know, how, did that, how does that impact overall planning? I want to spend a bit of time talking about how I see that folding out over the next uh, couple of years. Now, I'm going to frame everything I talk about in terms of overall markets. And when I say markets, I mean all markets. It could be high tech, it could be no tech, they can be consumer, they can be B2B. Regardless of, of, of the type of market, all markets go through the, basic, uh, the same basic maturation curve. You see a, a basic S curve. At the outset of the curve, you get early adoption, you get some steep um, adoption curve as the rest of people, you know, kind of come on board, and then you have the sunset phase where, you know, you, you kind of flatten out towards the end. And at the, by very definition, at the outset of any market, the products and the services, they do not exist. Um, so if you want to be able to do something that's required for that particular market, you can't do it. By very definition, you are underserved, meaning the thing that you want to do, you have no capability to do. And when you're underserved, what drives your overall purchase criteria? Well, you want to be able to do something. And so when you uh, evaluate you know, product A or product B, if it's got the right features, then you'll go ahead and make that purchase. Or maybe you want to do something that you can already do. And so you say, well, I can already do it, but I want to do it at 10x or 100x scale. And so if it has the right performance, then I'll go ahead and I'll buy there. Now, I want to be really clear about the dynamic that's in this, under, in this uh, underserved space. This is a sweet place to be if you are a vendor. Why? Because there's not very much competition. And if there's not competition, you'll notice one of the things that's up there that's not listed as one of the major um, uh, criteria for, for purchases, well, price isn't there. This tends to be an area that's very high price, high margin. Now, over time, though, new technology comes in. So if any of you have read, like, Clayton Christensen, uh, he wrote Innovator's Dilemma or Innovator's Solution, um, a guy named Michael Rayner wrote The Strategy Paradox. If you've read any of the, these kind of HBR, you know, Harvard Business Review type works, um, they suggest that over time, technology disruption comes from below. And when you come in from below, what happens is that technology becomes good enough. And when it's good enough, the market shifts from being underserved to well-served. Somebody's going to be well-served back there. Um, well served just means that if you want to be able to do something, you've got options A, B, C, D, E, right? You've got multiple, multiple options. And if all things being equal, if I've got five different ways that I can do what I want to do, then instead of choosing based on features or performance, what I do is I look at things like price and convenience. Um, price, I think we all understand, I won't go into price. Convenience, though, just means ease of, well, ease of everything. Ease of procurement, it can be ease of deployment. From a networking or IT perspective, it can be ease of provisioning, ease of monitoring, ease of integration, ease of automation, and so on. Um, so you look at that and you say, well, then all markets exist in, at some point on this curve. And the question for us is, well, where is networking or where is IT? Now, I don't have to guess where we are. It turns out the industry is actually talking to me. And if I listen to what the industry is saying, I can tell you exactly where we are on the curve. If you look at the five major technology trends today that are impacting data center and networking in particular, right? Number one, white box. When I say white box, I just mean the disaggregation of hardware and software, the idea that I can get off the shelf components and sell um, a white box switch, very similar to what happened in servers. Well, that, that's all about driving down price. As we expand and we look at things like software-defined networking. Software-defined networking is, and again, forget the definitional battles that people are going to have in the different tech tracks. SDN, for lack of a better, way, a better word, is, is just separating control and forwarding plane with the idea of creating a central entity that can manage your network so that you can automate workflow. Right? It's about making things easier. We look at NFV, Network Functions Virtualization. NFV, 
Uh, my definition of this, uh, don't quote this to any of the brocade people around here because they'll shoot me. Um, it's the x 86 ification of, and I'm not sure that's a real word, uh, but the x 86 ification of appliances. I can take general appliances like a load balancer or a firewall, and I can put those onto you know, COTS hardware and sell it at a much cheaper price. So NFV hits price. And then I need some way of chaining the services. So it starts to hit you know, orchestration and convenience as well. As we move beyond NFV, we get into overlays. Overlays, when I say overlays, I mean uh, VMware. NSX is a good example. Or you look at um, you know, guys like Nuage who are building out an overlay solution. Or even some of the startups like uh, Mitokura with Mitonet. Overlays, again, I'm not, without getting into definitions, really it's about edge policy management. If a workload moves from this part of the data center to this part of the data center, how do I move edge policy with it and make it faster? Overlays are all about convenience, making it easier. And the final, my personal favorite, uh, DevOps, or for the purists in the room, NetOps. Uh, DevOps is essentially treating infrastructure as code. And when I say treating infrastructure as code, what I mean is making it programmatic and faster to be able to perform certain activities in the network. Uh, this includes tools for those of the techies in the room. This is tools like Puppet and tools like Chef. But it goes beyond just those tools and into treating infrastructure generally like you would programming. That's all about making things faster. That's all about convenience. So if I were to have to conclude where is the overall market, I'd have to conclude that each of these each of these hits price or convenience. So on that previous curve that I showed, if you had to guess where networking is, you'd have to guess that we're kind of in that fairly well-served, more mature state, which means that as you start to consider next-gen uh, data center architectures, the things that you've historically looked at are not the same as the things that you're going to be, need to be looking at going forward. In fact, data centers will become simpler, not more complex over time. Now with that, then on, from price, right? So, so if, if price and convenience start to drive how we make decisions, then price is everything from equipment, so how much does it cost to procure, and even financing models start to get into that. Um, cabling and optics, obviously you look a lot at space, power, and cooling. I think the price side we understand pretty well. The convenience side, though, I don't think we, as an industry, I don't think we really nailed down what convenience means. Now, the first thing I want to talk about from a convenience perspective, convenience doesn't just mean things like automation. Ease of procurement actually matters. And so looking at, say, new financing models so that you can you know, break out the dollars and pay as you go, utility-based models are a good example of how you make procurement an easier thing to do. As you get beyond procurement, then you get into how easy is it to deploy, right? This can be physical deployments. It can be how do you, you know, cabling. But it can also be the initial provisioning pieces. How do I provision? How do I tie into provisioning tools? Do I have canned and productized workflows that make it easier to troubleshoot? Can I integrate with other systems in and around the network? Um, these are all the things that, that kind of roll into to convenience generally. Let me start with price. If you were to look, so the, 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 probably the biggest thing that's going to bring price down over the next, you know, I don't know, three, four, five years, right? We, the rise of merchant silicon is changing everything. Now, with merchant silicon, when I say merchant silicon, this is guys like Broadcom, guys like Cavium. There's new companies like Barefoot that are providing merchant silicon. In the past, networking vendors used to spend tens or hundreds of millions of dollars investing in custom ASICs. And this was actually what we, we had to do this, because the difference between a custom ASIC and merchant silicon in terms of capability throughput performance was quite wide in 2010. If you look at 2015, the difference between merchant silicon and custom silicon has narrowed. And if you were to forecast out to 2020, you'd see that, the, the, that they, they, they start to, to get very, very close together. Now, if this, from a performance and capability perspective, we're good enough, it means that the excess capacity, the excess capability that you're typically paying for with custom, with custom silicon, you don't need to pay for that if the silicon you can get is, is largely good enough. So if you look at data center architectures, we see a, a fairly major shift from, from custom to, to, to merchant silicon over time. All the major vendors are driving this. I don't, this isn't unique to any, any particular vendor. Um, this is going to be all solutions. But what it means for you guys is that you need to pay attention to the overall merchant silicon trends. If you're not watching what Broadcom is doing, if you're not watching what Cavium is doing, 
you ought to add these to the companies that are in your watch list so you can start to evaluate what solutions look like going forward. But it's not just vendors who have a role in price. Customers have a huge role in price. Um, I've spent a lot of years as a product manager, and we product managers, we are a sneaky, sneaky bunch of guys. Um, what we do is we sit in conference rooms, and like the guys from The Simpsons, you know, Smithers, where we do the, we plot and scheme, we look at how we can make our stuff more sticky. And every time we can produce a new feature, every time we can get a customer to deploy a new capability, that is not existent in the rest of our competitors, we force you, we kind of lock you into what we do. And so if I can convince you to do this very, you know, in, in my case, a very brocade thing, or if I was at Cisco, if I convinced you to do a very Cisco thing or a very Juniper thing, every time I convince you to take it one step down that path, always for good reasons, mind you, what it does is it, it makes it more and more difficult to create interchangeability between vendors, and that's how you get to single vendor systems. Um, if you have competition, I know I, I should have said this in the previous slide, I said the merchant silicon will drive pricing down, but the real dynamic here is anything that drives competition where I've got two things that are functionally equivalent, then we'll, you'll see price come down. You guys need to make sure you keep competition front and center. And it starts with architecting around open standards. So as you start looking, the, the, the architectures of the future will have fewer Again, fewer proprietary hooks into the, into the network. As you start looking at protocols, you need to start pulling things out of, the, out of the network. That's hard to do, though, because of the derivative RFP. So you guys, everyone here, you know, issues RFPs, RFIs, RFQs, whatever, right? And we all know, so uh, any of us who have any kind of engineering background, you know, engineers are notorious. What do we do? We cut and paste. And so you take the previous RFP, and so then you, when you want to go out and you will say, I'm going to add SDN to my network, you take the previous RFP, then you add a line SDN. So I had 276 requirements before, now I've got 277, they're the same, and then plus SDN. What we have to do, um, instead of starting with derivative RFPs, is we have to get to next-gen architectures by starting essentially with a blank slate and saying, what are the features and requirements that I actually need in my network? If you want to strip out cost in the network, if you want to strip out operational cost, it starts with removing things, not with adding things. And from an RFP process, that's, that's where it all begins. You guys kind of set the stage when you go into engagements. It's important that you start setting that with your next-gen architectures in mind. Now, convenience, I mentioned it's the ease of everything. So what's the enemy? What's easy's mortal enemy? The enemy of easy is complexity. And as, as, as Pithy as this sounds, it means that the objective of next-gen data center architecture has to be to reduce complexity. And there's three ways you can reduce complexity. By far, the number one thing that you can do to reduce complexity is to remove things. Once you remove stuff, you can, and I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail, um, you can abstract, and I'll talk about kind of what abstraction means, but just generally think of, of representing many things as a single thing. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about automation. Remove. Um, the best bet you can get, the best return on any investment you'll get is by fundamentally deploying fewer devices. Um, when we talk about the complexity of managing devices, it scales linearly with the number of devices that are being managed. And so if you have a network of 100 devices, that would be a more difficult network to, to, to manage than a network with, say, 20 devices. Moving from three-tier legacy architectures to flatter two-tier architectures is probably one of the biggest things that you can do individually to start planning for driving complexity out of the network. If you look at what the massive scale, what we call MSDCs, massively scaled data centers, if you look at what MSDC is, guys like Google, guys like Facebook, guys like Netflix, if you look at what they've done, what they've done is they've driven down essentially the number of devices in their network by going with flatter topologies. And the second thing they've done is they've reduced the number, like the, the, the differences in form factor within those topologies. Let me give you an example. Uh, everyone knows Southwest Airlines. Southwest is supposed to be the low airfare airline. How did they do it? What they did was they actually, they... That's not good. I thought that was like a bomb or something. I didn't... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look at what Southwest did, Southwest reduced the number of the, the airplanes they have. They only use a 737. Why would you only use a 737? Because you, only, you, you can train your mechanics one time. 
Every single crew can, can move from plane to plane to plane, and there's no change in, in service. So they can, very, the equipment becomes very portable. Uh, it means that the gate agents can all optimize for a certain set of processes. All of their manuals can be written a single way. If you look at the, the, the power of removing variations in their architecture, what they've done is they've driven their costs down. If you look at what Google does, you look at what Facebook does, you look at what Yahoo does, AOL or uh, uh, Microsoft or whoever, any of, the, any of the big web properties, what they're doing is driving down the variations in their overall network so they can get similar form factor devices. In order to do that, they want to keep competition high, so they look for interchangeability. And the only way you can make sure that two devices are interchangeable is to get to the, essentially the lowest common denominator for what the features and functions are. That's how you control costs. That's how you drive down costs over a, long, over a long period of time. Facebook said they saved $2 billion. $2 billion. This came out like last week, right? It's not just removing infrastructure, though. We can remove technology. Start looking at you know, um, using fabric-based technologies. You know, Lloyd mentioned in the opening session this idea of fabric. So one of the things about fabrics is that you can treat the network as well, a single device. And that single device, you can get rid of things like spanning tree. Every time I can remove a technology that has to be provisioned, maintained, and troubleshot, I start driving down cost. And so you should be looking at how do you pull technologies out. Now, the derivative RFP, it says we're always adding, we're always adding. U.S. tax code, we're always adding, right? What you want to do is you want to be pulling stuff out, and you should be thinking through thoughtfully what are the technologies you can remove. Now, it starts with things like spanning trees. I look to next-gen architectures. It means removing tech, uh, entire protocols like um, OSPF and ISIS. If I run BGP to the top of rack, as an example, then I can settle on one common protocol, which means all of my provisioning systems become simpler. I can remove complex traffic engineering as well, right? So once I use simple like ECMP in simple flat architectures, I can start to remove some of the more complex traffic management that I typically do across the WAN. I can start to simplify some of that and make it much easier to manage. Anything I can do to remove something entirely, I get the biggest bang for my operational buck. Look at abstraction. Abstraction comes in many forms. Put simply, abstraction is making many things look like a smaller set of things. Fabrics, again, I'll start with fabrics. If I can take 48 devices and make them look like one logical device, that gives me one thing I have to manage. It gives me one thing I have to administer, to provision, to integrate, to, tra to train on. Fabrics give me a way of abstracting out many devices and then using a, just a simple, common underlying infrastructure to drive my overall network. But it's not just fabrics. As we look at SDN, software-defined networking, software-defined networking introduces well, it introduces the controller. The controller takes a bunch of network elements, maybe 50 or 500 or 1,000 network elements, and gives you a single point from which you can provision and manage that overall uh, networking entity. Again, it's about simplifying the number of places you have to go to accomplish some meaningful task. But we don't stop with controllers. The future, uh, oh, I, I, I screwed myself up on my slide here. I should have put policy next, but I put commands. Um, what most people think about in terms of overall um, automation, by the way, is not automation. The most common example of automation, I've got 20 commands, so someone writes a Perl script, and then I got one command. It's not automation. That's abstraction. I make 20 things look like one thing, right? Very, very powerful in terms of a huge, huge benefit, but that is, that is in fact abstraction. And as you look forward, it's going to be things like policy abstraction, being able to express application or tenant intent in a way that's not um, tied to the underlying technology. Simple example, and I wish I had a Fed example for you guys, but I don't. Um, if I take HIPAA as a, as a good example, um, I ought to be able to, at some point, say that this particular application has to be HIPAA compliant, which has certain requirements around how it's encrypted, how traffic is segmented and isolated. I need to be able to do that, and then have that be translated by a controller or by a fabric into underlying behavior. Once you do that, then you automate all the things. Now, when we talk about automation, there's a couple of points I want to make. Automation is not just removing keystrokes. If your objective is to make it faster for your people to type something so that they make fewer mistakes, the best return on investment you will get is to send your teams to a typing class because they will, in fact, type faster and they will, in fact, make fewer mistakes. Automation is not just about removing keystrokes. Automation is about getting two things that come together to work together for some task. 
Now those two things, it could be an organization. It could be that you and I are working across the, you know, organization boundaries to accomplish something. Or it could be two systems. It could be a router and a switch, a switch and a switch. But it's not just networking. It could be a switch and a load balancer. It could be a switch and a provisioning system. It could be a switch and a help desk ticketing system. There's all kinds of things that, that beg for automation. And the key to automating those things is data. If two things need to work together, whether it's people or systems, it's all about how they get data back and forth. If you and I have to work today, what we'll do is we'll talk, we'll have a conversation. And that conversation, that's, well, that's data. And if we replace you with 500 people, and we replace me with 500 people, what we do is we replace the conversation with a help desk ticket, with a ticketing system. The ticketing system just contains data, workflow. Whenever we think about how things talk to each other, it's all about data. Coordination requires communication, and so the key of automation is about how do you get data between different systems. Now, the networking industry at large is horrific at automation, and I say that not very proudly. We are terrible at making things automated. As, as vendors, we are all complicit in this. We are brutal at giving you guys easier um, environments to work in. Why? We understand capability, right? So automation is capability in context. As vendors, we understand capability. If you need something, I will give you a, a, a new box. If you need something else, let me give you a software pack. If you need something else, let me give you, you know, a, a new protocol. Right? We're very good at capability. What we're terrible at is context. Context. Context is the surrounding architecture. It's the surrounding systems. It's the processes. It's even the people. And if you don't understand how all that stuff comes together, then the best you can do as a vendor to provide automation is I'll tell you, hey, I got an API for that. Now, if I give you an API and I come back a month later and say, oh, hey, I gave you that great API. Are you more automated? You're going to look at me and say, no, I have a day job. I have to manage all my infrastructure. By the way, it's not just your gear, it's everyone else's gear too. And your API, while I was flattered that you gave it to me, you didn't actually automate anything. Why vendors don't automate is because we don't understand the context in which you operate. Now everyone here I hope is under some kind of NDA because I'm gonna tell you a secret. You can't go back to Silicon Valley and tell anybody I told you this. Products are driven by guys like me, product managers. How many networks do you think I've personally architected, built, and operated? Any guesses? Zero. So how am I, and, and, and I'm not, I'm, I'm representative of all product managers everywhere. If I've never built and, operate, built and operated a network, how am I gonna understand context? The answer is I'm not. What we have to do as an industry is bring context in. It's not enough to have guys that understand IETF drafts. You gotta pull people in who've been customers, who've been operators, who come in and work side by side product management to start to architect workflows that can be productized. As you guys start to evaluate you know, your next gen architectures, don't just get hung up on the capability side. Make sure you understand context as well. Because if you're not talking about context, what you're gonna get is a toolbox, which is like your own DIY. And I don't know if you're like me, but I demoed my entire garage under the premise that I was gonna build it back up and finish it up. And my wife, she had to call contractors who came in after a couple of weeks and then redid the whole thing because I had no idea what context looks like. That's what you guys are challenged with. So if I were to kind of summarize, look, architecture, the future of architecture, I know everyone comes in here, you know, tell me what the next you know, big physical thing is gonna be. The future of, of the data center um, is more about operations than pure transport. It's about how quickly can you roll out services. It's about tying together things like um, you know, monitoring and analytics and using that to drive uh, uh, automated remediation. It's about policy management. It's about all the soft stuff that goes on top of the physical infrastructure. I would love to stand here and tell you that the physical infrastructure gets more complicated over time, but the networks you know, a year out, three years out, five years out will actually be dramatically simpler than they are today. The, to, to, uh, the topologies that you're deploying will actually be you know, arguably less capable than what you have today. For us, price is a combination of form factor and open architectures. Make sure you pay attention to both. Um, there, should, there should be no religion about custom or merchant silicon. There should be no religion about hardware or software form factor. It's a price performance curve and there can be no religion. And then as you do it, you need to be driving interoperability through open architectures. Strip out what you can, abstract everything that remains, and ultimately automate the rest. That is the future of automation or uh, network architectures. 
Um, if there's any questions, comments, or concerns, I'll hang around, but I think you guys have about 15 minutes to get to your next session. Thank you.